peace in the Middle East. President Trump weighs in on what the deal between Israel and the United Arab Emirates means for Christians in the region. We also have reaction from a Catholic priest in Jerusalem. Faith and politics. A congressman from New York tells us why he was so moved by a visit from Pope Francis. And the beauty of faith. How one artist depicted the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which we celebrate tomorrow. On EWTN News Nightly for Friday, August 14th, 2020. Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. President Donald Trump responds to a family emergency. His younger brother, Robert Trump, is hospitalized in New York and is reportedly seriously ill. The president changed his schedule today to be by his bedside. The development caps off a busy week at the White House, including a historic peace accord that could impact Christians in the Middle East. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, here at the White House, President Trump told reporters today that his brother Robert is having a hard time and that hopefully he'll be okay. In the meantime, the president is responding to news tonight that a former FBI attorney will plead guilty to making a false statement in connection with the Russia probe. What happened should never happen again. At the White House, President Donald Trump addresses reporters. He is uh, pleading guilty. Terrible thing. Terrible thing. Fact is, they spied on my campaign and they got caught. The president has also been weighing in on the November elections. He's made it clear where he stands on mail-in voting. But New Jersey will still move to a nearly all-male election. That follows what they did in their July primary. So we're going to have a hybrid model in November. We like what we saw. We'll tweak it. Uh, and that's where we're headed. Meanwhile, the White House is receiving international praise for the Abraham Accord announced yesterday, normalizing relations between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. But the peace deal is also being condemned. Palestinians at Friday prayers in Jerusalem stomping on the UAE flag. And Turkey called the accord a betrayal. The Turkish president telling reporters he may suspend diplomatic ties with the UAE. I asked President Trump how the new accord might help struggling and persecuted Christians in the Middle East. Christians have been persecuted by some countries in particular in the Middle East. And I think this is a big start. It's going to be a very strong start, very powerful start. And it's something that I will tell you, I've told David and I've told every one of our negotiators, if you look at the way Christians have been treated in some countries, it's, it's beyond disgraceful. Also tonight, to help struggling Americans in this pandemic, the president says he is directing the Treasury Secretary to send $3,400 direct payments to families of four across the country, but that needs Democratic approval first. Tracy? All right, thank you so much, Owen. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reporting for us tonight. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says the agreement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates is welcoming news. Just the fact that they will, I think, exchange ambassadors and the rest, it's exciting. The speaker called the news an important step that could benefit the region and the world. Senator Jim Risch, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, also applauded the move, saying in a statement, I hope to see other countries across the Arab and Muslim world follow the UAE's lead. Reaction continues to pour in following the announcement yesterday of a plan to normalize relations between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. Father David Newhouse, Superior of the Jesuits in the Holy Land, joins us tonight from Jerusalem. Father, thank you for your time today. So do you believe this deal will bring peace and political stability to the region? Well, no, I don't think that it will immediately bring peace or stability. In fact, it's rather strange to call it a peace agreement because the United Arab Emirates are not at war with Israel. And contacts have been friendly going all the way back to 2003. In fact, what is more of a surprise is that this seems to be being packaged as a peace deal when, in fact, it is the normalization of relations that have been friendly just under the radar for a long time already. What we fear is, and it doesn't need to say that our fears will be actualized, but what we fear is that this is further 
a further normalization of a very abnormal situation where the burning issue is relations between Israel and the Palestinians, the ongoing occupation, and, of course, discrimination within the state of Israel. This is really the core of the conflict. And as far as we can tell, there isn't much that is clear with regard to what role this conflict will play in the normalization of relations between the United Arab Emirates and Israel. Um, this is our really big concern. Father, what are the implications for Christians living in the West Bank? Christians are desperately in need of justice and peace, an end to the conflict. Uh, Christians have been suffering like all Palestinians have been suffering. And because Christians are a very small part of the population, they are particularly vulnerable in a situation of instability, violence, and ongoing unrest in the region. And for this, we really need a very serious approach to justice and peace. This is exactly what we are not really clear about when it comes to what will happen when diplomatic relations are established between the state of Israel, particularly under the present government of Benjamin Netanyahu and the United Arab Emirates, because the present regime is not doing very much in order to further that which Christians need the most, and that is justice and peace in our region. I'd like to switch gears just a bit. What is the current status of pilgrimage in the Holy Land amidst the coronavirus pandemic? Do you know? Well, sure, we know. We, we live it on a day-to-day -day basis. Huh? Um, all tourism and pilgrimage is almost dead. In other words, Israel has got a very high rate of contagion. Uh, the number of people with the virus is not decreasing. The borders are almost closed. Um, visas are not being given for people to come in. Of course, citizens can return home, and people who are here can travel outside. It's not clear that they will get back if they are not citizens. But pilgrimage groups are not coming. And this is very, very sad. The, the holy places, of course, are abandoned. But also, it is a terrible blow to the whole industry that deals with tourism, the hotels, the guides, many of whom, when it comes to pilgrimage, are Christians. Well, Father David Newhouse, thank you so much for your time and for your analysis today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It is my great pleasure. Well, China is also weighing in on the diplomatic breakthrough brokered by President Trump between Israel and the UAE. A foreign ministry spokesman says China welcomes any measures to help ease tensions in the Middle East. And China, quote, hopes the relevant parties will take concrete actions to bring the Palestinian issue back on track. The U.S. Secretary of State says Iran is the world's biggest sponsor of terrorism and should not be allowed to buy and sell weapons. Mike Pompeo also says an arms embargo has nothing to do with the Iranian nuclear deal. So we're urging the whole world to join us, to just make the simple statement, this isn't about the JCPOA. This is about whether the world is going to permit Iran to buy and sell weapon systems. Again, it's that clear. It's that simple. The U.N. Security Council is voting today on whether to extend the arms embargo on Iran. It expires in October. But Russia and China are expected to use their veto. Secretary Pompeo spoke after meeting with Austria's foreign minister, both of whom also expressed concern about the mass arrest in Belarus following Sunday's disputed elections. Afghanistan has started to release some of the last Taliban prisoners, opening the way to final negotiations on ending the longest war in U.S. history. Just over 80 of the final 400 Taliban fighters were freed today. The prisoner exchange is part of an agreement between the U.S. and the Taliban to end the Afghan war, which has lasted over 18 years. The government of South Korea is increasing the number of doctors, but those already on the job don't want more and are protesting. 
Thousands of doctors went on strike and held a rally in the capital of Seoul. Today, they are protesting a decision to expand medical schools and add more doctors. South Korea's health ministry recently announced that it's adding 4,000 doctors over the next 10 years. In North Korea, leader Kim Jong-un is lifting a lockdown of the city of Kaesong. It is located on the border with South Korea, where thousands have been in quarantine for weeks. Kim also insisted that the North will keep its borders shut, and he rejected any outside help in order to deal with the coronavirus pandemic. Coming up, a lawmaker from New York talks about his Catholic upbringing. One of the final pro-life Democrats on Capitol Hill won his primary earlier this week. Representative Colin Peterson claimed three-fourths of the vote in the 7th District. In November, he will face Republican Michelle Fishbach, the former state lieutenant governor, who is also pro-life. The Nebraska Catholic Conference adds its voice to pro-lifers celebrating the historic passage of a Nebraska bill protecting unborn children by banning dismemberment abortion in that state. A written statement by Marion Minor, Associate Director for Pro-Life and Family at the Nebraska Catholic Conference, reads in part, quote, Life has won today in Nebraska. By ending dismemberment abortion, our state has demonstrated and reaffirmed its deep respect for the human dignity of pre-born children and their mothers. Joining me now on Skype is Republican State Senator Suzanne Geist, who sponsored this important piece of legislation. Senator, welcome to the show. Great to have you on. Thank you, Tracy. It's nice to be here. So I know that you introduced this bill back in January. Why was it so important to you to bring this before the legislature? And also, I'm curious, how did it feel once it finally passed? Well, I brought this bill originally uh, because I saw uh, politically an open time that I thought we could actually get it passed. Um, it's also close to my heart. I have a, our oldest granddaughter was born to her mom when she was 15. And I saw the courage that it took that young woman to have a child, um, keep her, raise her. She then met my son and got married. And um, that kind of gave me wind in my sails. Um, she's just been a great example of, of courage and strength and a good mom. And so that girl is now almost 13, and that's why I brought the bill. Um, and how I felt when it passed, oh, enormously relieved. Uh, and it, it, we got exactly the number of votes we needed, not one more. Um, and it was a squeaker down to the end. So it, I'm very relieved and now just thrilled. It took me about 24 hours for it to sink in. So I'm very excited. That's wonderful, wonderful indeed. Well, in addition to banning this horrific dismemberment procedure, what else does this bill do? Well, it does ban the procedure. And just to be clear, this is a second trimester dismemberment abortion. So th between the weeks 12 and 24. And um, what it also does it is it gives a, a criminal penalty to a physician who performs this. We had to have a penalty part of the bill so that the practice would actually stop. Our desire isn't to lock up physicians, but it is to have a penalty that's strong enough that will discourage the practice. Senator, are you at all concerned about possible court challenges from opponents? Um, you know, we've been threatened whenever Nebraska has passed any pro-life legislation. We're always threatened um, a court challenge. Uh, I, of course, I don't want that. However, um, that's part of being a legislator. Uh, that's part of this business. Um, I, I anticipate that that could happen. We did have an opinion that was given from our attorney general over our bill that someone who was opposed to it requested. And our attorney general said that this is likely constitutional. Uh, the, the laws in Nebraska and the situation of this bill, um, our uh, facts in our case would be different from the other states who have, in whose state it's been found unconstitutional. So we feel very comfortable that we're on constitutional grounds and that it will be upheld. 
I know the bill now heads to the governor's desk for his signature, and I know that he supports the bill. What message do you think this sends about the culture of life in Nebraska? And also, what message do you think it sends to pro-lifers? It, I hope, is a message of great encouragement. Um, it sends a message that Nebraska is a pro-life state. Uh, we have said that for the past few years, um, but it is the truth. And uh, I think that's the message this is gonna send. Um, I'm really excited. And I know that the people in this state, I've received hundreds of emails of thank yous. And um, I just, I think this is gonna be very well received in this state. Well, Senator, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for what you do. We appreciate it. Nebraska State Senator Suzanne Geis, again, thank you for being here. Thank you. In tonight's Faith and Politics series, Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales sits down with Catholic Congressman John Cato of New York. The three-term Republican says that he strives to work with lawmakers of both parties and shares how he keeps his Catholic faith at the center of his life. Faith is the greatest gift there is to me, and it makes it a lot easier to deal with the ups and downs of life. Working together, but staying true to his Catholic beliefs is the code Congressman John Katko says he strives for. If you do want to others as you have them do to you, then you won't be a knucklehead here, and you won't be one of the people obstructing and screaming and yelling. Yeah, you know, you'll be one of the people getting things done. His office wall is filled with bills he's authored or co-sponsored, which have become law, many during President Obama's administration. The Pope of the Holy See. In 2015, when Pope Francis spoke before Congress, security was tight. But Congressman Katko noticed President Obama's cabinet members being rushed into a room. So he and his wife followed them. The door opens. Here comes the Pope. And I was clearly the lowest man on a totem pole as far as leadership goes. And I'll be darned if the guy didn't sense it because he turned and the only person he blessed were me and my wife. He even got a picture to prove it. It was one of the greatest moments of my life. Growing up Catholic, his parents, especially his proud Irish mom, always made sure he was at Sunday Mass. I appreciate them with their diligence with that because uh, it became a very big part of our lives. And that's, that was great. And so now I, I, every night before I go to bed, and uh, that's my bed right there, pulls out on the couch. You heard right. He sleeps in his office. Although he's had offers to stay with friends, he says there's something fundamentally humbling about sleeping in the Capitol. But I, every night before, I, when I lay down, I pull out the, the Bible that I was given when I first got here, and I'm, I'm reading it. And even though I know how it ends... <laughs> Congressman Katko and his wife of nearly 30 years, Robin, have three boys, two of them adopted. Just one of the many reasons why protecting the unborn is important to him. You know, I'm all about trying to find compromise. Uh, there's no middle ground there, right? In my district, it would be a lot easier if I was pro-choice. A lot easier. Uh, but you know, despite that, I, 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 I stand strong. Congressman Katko tells me reading God's word, his Catholic faith, and his family all keep him grounded. From the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Up next, a look at the story of St. Maximilian Kolbe and how the Assumption of the Virgin Mary is depicted in artwork. Today marks the 79th anniversary of St. Maximilian Kolbe's death. He was a prisoner in the Auschwitz concentration camp in Poland, where he gave up his life to save another man. EWTN's Alan Holdren has a story. Work makes one free, says the inscription in German at the entrance of the Auschwitz concentration camp in Poland. Thousands of people entered this gate and never returned home. But on August the 14th, 1941, St. Maximilian Maria Kolbe went against the idea of violence by sacrificing his own life in exchange for another man's. Father Piotr Wisniewski, director of EWTN Poland, walks us through the camp and tells us that his own grandfather was imprisoned at the same block, number 11, where St. Maximilian Kolbe offered up his life. We are here with two reasons. 
Father Piot tells us St. Maximilian spent the last two weeks of his life with ten other people in this cell. St. Maximilian led the prisoners in prayer, standing or kneeling in the middle of the cell. According to an eyewitness who worked as a janitor in the prison, one day the Nazis selected a fellow inmate, Franciszek Gajovnicek, and nine other men to die. But after listening to Gajovnicek speak of his wife and two sons, St. Maximilian volunteered to die in his place. After two weeks, St. Maximilian was the only one who remained alive. Father Piotr says the Nazis were running out of time and so they decided to kill St. Maximilian by an injection of carbolic acid, phenol. He met his death by voluntarily holding his left palm open, demonstrating with this gesture his love and forgiveness to all those who sought justice through their closed fists and violence. St. Maximilian Kolbe was cremated on August the 15th on the Feast of the Assumption of Mary. As the founder of the Knights of the Immaculate, he truly served Our Lady until his final breath. In Rome, Alan Holdren, EWTN News Nightly. Our Catholics and many other Christians will celebrate the Feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. This significant feast day recalls the spiritual and physical departure of the Mother of Jesus Christ from the earth when both her soul and her body were taken into the presence of God. Joining me now on Skype to help us take a look at the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary through art is Jem Sullivan, author of The Beauty of Faith. Jem, welcome back. Always great to see you. Thank you for having me, Tracy. So, Jim, how long has the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary been depicted in art? So, Tracy, it was Pope Pius XII who, in 1950, defined the dogma of Mary's Assumption. But well before then, belief in Mary's bodily Assumption was part of Catholic devotion and tradition for centuries. And flowing from that long tradition, painters, sculptors, musicians, and poets brought to life in artistic forms this Catholic belief in Mary's Assumption. Jim, tell us about this depiction of Mary's Assumption from the National Gallery of Art. Sure. This scene is a sketch based on an altarpiece completed by Peter Paul Rubens. He was the master Baroque painter of the 17th century. And Rubens painted scenes with movement and intense color. So this replica is a good example of his style and was probably completed by his assistants in his studio. We see Mary being assumed into heaven as she's carried up by angels. Everything in the painting is moving to that place in the scene where two angels hold a wreath of flowers and are ready to crown Mary queen of heaven. Below them, we see Mary's empty tomb, surrounded by a group of Old Testament figures, apostles, and women perhaps the gospel women named Mary. And in this group stands one of the apostles with his arms outstretched to heaven in praise of God. And, you know, his perspective is meant to be our perspective as we celebrate the crowning moment in Mary's life today. And, Jim, what can we take away from this magnificent 17th century painting? You know, in a way, Tracy, Mary's entire life, from her Immaculate Conception to the Annunciation to the death and resurrection of Jesus, her son, all of this was a preparation for her assumption, body and soul, into heavenly glory. And this artist's magnificent vision of Mary's assumption reminds us that God desires that we follow in Mary's footsteps, that our final destiny is to be with God for all eternity to join in that endless praise of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the company of the angels, the saints, and with Mary, Mother of God, Mother of the Church, and Queen of Heaven and Earth. Well, Jim, thank you so much for sharing this with us today. We really appreciate it. Jim Sullivan, author of The Beauty of Faith. Thank you again. Thank you, Tracy. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.